All right, back again. Uh, now to talk about what might be the last Baudrillard text I do. Um, I got a request to do the evil demon of images, and I might still do it in the future, but the thing that has deterred me is the fact that it's all on YouTube already. Uh, there's already, I think, a clip of Baudrillard delivering it, and it's pretty much the same as everything else, uh, So, and it's short. So I, I think that I'm having trouble justifying going ahead and doing it, but who knows, I might cave. Uh, but today, this would be Baudrillard's last book, and the last book that I'll kind of take on. But besides this one, uh, there are a few that are essentially just collections of essays, uh, for, for example, screened out. So in that text, there are a number of different things taken up by uh, Baudrillard that really resonate with some of his early work and stuff all the way through. Uh, but I'd, I'm going to leave that one for people to read on their own if they're interested. However, I want to take the time, starting out here, to discuss something that he brings up in that text or is among the essays in that text that I think is really important, and that is his discussion about diseases, specifically cancer and, uh, and AIDS. So I'll start there with this essay from Screened Out, which appears in other places as well. Uh, but I'll talk about that and then move into the intelligence of evil. So in Screened Out, at least the first chapter, uh, titled Prophylaxis and uh, Virulence, Virulence, or sorry, AIDS, Virulence or Prophylaxis, Baudrillard is wondering to what extent um, a disease or autoimmune disorder uh, such as AIDS, how that is a symptom of a greater cultural uh, kind of malaise, which isn't to say that it only comes about because of that, but I think that he paints a really interesting portrait. So in the case of AIDS for Baudrillard, uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon in that it is the um, inability of the body to kind of regenerate itself, the inability of the body to recognize, um, I guess, what is killing it, right? So it's the slow deterioration of the immune system that eventually leads to someone not being able to defend themselves from, you know, common cold or, or other kinds of things like pneumonia or something. So for Baudrillard, AIDS, in his words, uh, makes its appearance when a body, system, or network expels all its negative elements and resolves into a combinatorial of simple ones. So in relation to this, he says that the AIDS body is the body damaged and impaired in its immune systems, in its systems of controls and antibodies. So he opposes AIDS with another disease, that is cancer, that for Baudrillard does almost the opposite. So in AIDS, there is um, a slow deterioration of the body, whereas in cancer, there's a proliferation of cells. So while those things aren't obviously the opposite in a you know, medical context, uh, the, the picture he, he, he paints with them in this way, I think is, is, is fair. So of cancer, he says that the body, uh, the body of cancer is the body fallen victim to the disruption of its genetic formula. But what is similar between these two diseases for Baudrillard is that they are both illnesses of a codified modeled body. They are sicknesses of the code and the model. So the code and the model go back as early as Baudrillard's first works, his first text, uh, when he suggests that the code is essentially, this is a, it's a difficult thing to define, but uh, he lays it out as being the kind of total structuration or the total um, containment of the world under a certain logic. So this being the code. The code has a number of synonymous terms or kind of correlative ideas like the structural law of value or the general law of equivalence. So these are two ideas that come out in Symbolic Exchange and Death, where you're, he believes that there is a kind of homogenization of all things under a kind of umbrella principle, most closely tied to Western rationality and you know Western uh, cultural imperialism and stuff like that, that 
submits all different cultures, all different ideas to uh, to its you know to its own authority. So these two diseases that Baudrillard says are horrible, like they're absolutely terrible. Um, but he says that they are, in a very in a Hegelian way, he's saying that they arrive in proportion to the systems that or to the um, positivization of the body, in a sense, or how the body expels um, expels viruses and disease, germs, anything like that. Baudrillard suggests that these types of germs, what we could broadly call evil, and that is a bit of a stretch, but let's say that these uh, diseases are bad things, put it under the banner of evil, uh, they will emerge or, guess, resurrect in more oppressive forms to match the logic of the uh, positivization of the body in this case. So in his words, in systems moving towards total positivization, and hence desymbolization, evil simply equates in all its forms with the fundamental rule of reversibility. So this is his one of his, I, I guess, uh, maxims. That is that reversibility is always present. So no matter how perfect something is, it'll always fall prey to its opposite, in a sense, that will wrest it from its comfortable position and disturb that position propelling it into new uh, new territories and this is closely linked with the idea of seduction so that thing being seduced from its position into something new something other than itself so for those that listen to the last one I did on Baudrillard um, he presents us with the idea of ventriloquist evil so that's the idea of evil coming out in different ways in this kind of uh, in the paradigm that we find ourselves in, that is one of total positive positivity. So this, I guess, AIDS and cancer could be understood as ventriloquist evils because they are the manifestation of this thing called evil that is wholly necessary. Um, they are the manifestation of this thing called evil in a very bad form. So these diseases follow or are still something to be a little bit wary of. So we should... Uh, reserve or celebration of these diseases, of course. So in Baudrillard's words, he says that the uninterrupted production of positivity has a terrifying consequence. If negativity engenders crisis and critique, absolute positivity for its part engenders catastrophe precisely through its incapacity to distill the crisis. So a system that approaches perfection will inevitably cannibalize itself. It will inevitably become fall prey to its own logic. Or it will run the risk, in his words, uh, the risk of cancer, of a positivity devouring its own cells. The case of the body here, at least in its relation to disease, serves as a microcosm for Baudrillard to understand uh, the greater situation going on in society at large, where you have the symbolic falling prey to the technological, or illusion falling prey to rationality, you have, um, or as well, illusion falling falling prey to reality and simulation, which is really Baudrillard's, or has been Baudrillard's concern since, you know, a text as early as I would say for a critique of the political economy of the sign, uh, when he kind of introduced these concepts and ideas. Now, this is where Baudrillard gets a little bit problematic. So in imagining the point of these diseases, Baudrillard suggests that perhaps they serve the end of um, they serve the end of stopping the system from entering a, a, a point at which an even greater threat will be posed. So for him, one of the things that he writes against is the total explosion of liberation or a kind of liberatory project uh, that sees everything be realized, that sees everything be devoured by the you know or stripped and brought on stage by the jackals of, you know, Western, uh, Western modernity. And so he says that AIDS and cancer are two things that prohibit that development to some extent, or prohibit that, um, that act of bringing everything on stage and kind of put up barriers to slow the system down. So he suggests that maybe in a sense, there is some use to it. Now, with that being said, of course, he recognizes that these things suck. 
Like, I think that he, he died of cancer, uh, himself. Uh, but there's no doubt that he disavows here, you know, the real people suffering. And that's important to consider. So for him, these sudden whirlwinds, as he, so he says, we call catastrophes are keeping, are what keep us from catastrophe. So these anomalies, these extreme phenomena recreate zones of gravitation and density, which prevent things from dispersing totally. We may see this as our society secreting their own particular form of a cur cursed share, like those tribes which rid themselves of their excess population by suicidal plunges into the ocean, a homeopathic suicide of some of the members which preserve the homeostatic balance of the whole. Which I think is total, it's very um, possible, and it should be noted that th this isn't something orchestrated by anyone in particular, you know, even some, though some People out there like to think that AIDS was uh, constructed by people in a lab. Uh, Baudrillard is just considering the extent to which this is possibly a symptom of a greater problem. That is the problem of perfectibility, the problem of total operationality of a system that will always succumb to what he's laid out in the past, that is reversibility. So we should look First, if we were to take Baudrillard's word at this, we should look first of all to um, this project of perfectibility and see how that is in many ways the genesis point for things like AIDS or cancer or any other horrible diseases that kind of take their revenge on the system and on the, the people. And of course, there's no doubt or there's no um, surprise that these things happen to affect marginalized people first uh, because those people we have to do away with those people it's kind of like the system wanting to accelerate itself by getting rid of rid of what it doesn't appreciate so on that note now we'll go into the intelligence of evil or this or the lucidity pact it's a long title uh, and with this one like we get a lot of the same right so there it's going to be repetitive but i'm going to try and sift through this to bring out the things that haven't been discussed as much, pertaining primarily to his discussion of good and evil, uh, the w what role reversibility and seduction play in that, and the necessary, the necessity of antagonism, or maintaining the law of antagonism, or rule of antagonism. But most importantly in this text, he gives us a new term. That is integral reality. So integral reality is for Baudrillard kind of like the apotheosis of the, of the simulacrum. So how I think most people would understand the simulacrum, and this should be, you know, um, this should be evaluated by these by these people that might think this, uh, that the simulacrum is an oppressive force, that it's totally malevolent, that the simulacrum is what what opposes reality. Whereas I, I personally do not think that that's the case at all, at least in uh, Baudrillard's context. He is not writing so much against the simulacrum as he is writing against a project of perfection, as I was alluding to in the first part here, talking about disease. Because the simulacrum has always, to some extent, been on the scene. We've always been simulacral. However, what has changed in this current uh, paradigm is that the simulacrum has such a profound affinity with this thing called reality. So it's not as though the simulacrum opposes reality because they've always been in a kind of antagon antagonistic struggle, uh, we might say. But there was no illusions about it in the past. So one example that Baudrillard gives in another text was um, the act of copying. So to have uh, perfectly copied an image, like if you see a painting and you are able to perfectly duplicate it, that in itself was considered, you know, a work of art. Like, wow, you were able to do this amazing feat. Like, that, that's incredible. Whereas today, there's such, at least this is the idea, uh, the, the copy is looked down upon so much. But for Baudrillard, he would say, well, the, the, the original isn't like some kind of real transcendent thing that, you know, corresponds to this thing called reality or truth or, or anything like that but is in fact itself part of that very simulacral system. So our opposition to things that are very explicitly, or that very explicitly belong to 
uh, artificiality or virtuality or simulation. So like our technology, like computers and, and cell phones and apps and all that type of stuff. Um, for Baudrillard, our focus on that serves the end of convincing us that outside of this paradigm, and this is what is presented on television series like Black Mirror, uh, that outside of this paradigm is a kind of possibility. And that is where reality is. So this is the imagery presented in the Matrix, where it's uh, the only task is to get outside of the Matrix and you can be free. Whereas for Baudrillard, that's not the case. The problem for Baudrillard is precisely that narrative that there is this thing called reality that can be attained and that that reality is unchanging and universal. Because for Baudrillard, all that is, is just us submitting ourselves to most likely a kind of scientific logic that uh, is in itself the most oppressive because it forecloses possibility. It forecloses difference, kind of submitting everything to the neo-imperialistic neo tendencies of you know Western rationality. So integral reality is the kind of the highest point of that climax, if you will. So in his words, what I call integral reality is the per perpetrating on the world of an unlimited operational project whereby everything becomes real. Everything becomes visible and transparent. Everything is liberated. So we can get the sense with this, this passage that I, I think I'm being pretty faithful to Baudrillard's work here in my description of it. So what we see then, or what he gives us, is a kind of, and it's ironic that this really comes out in his last book, really, because uh, he died just a couple of years, three years or so after this was released. But anyways, I digress. Um, so what is he, what is he, what he kind of mourns is not the death of reality, as some people who read Baudrillard might be want to think. Rather, it is the uh, death of illusion, which he tells us here, uh, of all places in his last book, that this is what he's writing about. So, as he says, now the world, even freed from all illusion, does not lend itself at all to reality. The more we advance in this undertaking, the more ambiguous it becomes, the more it loses sight of itself. Reality has barely had a time to exist, and already it is disappearing. That is because we are entering the, entering the phase most often associated with the idea of hyper-reality that, sees, that marks the end or us being freed, as I just read here, from all illusion. So illusion not corresponding to that uh, rational logic, right? So another example of this, to go back quite a few years to uh, his book Seduction, toward the end of that, he makes the case that it's quite sad that people don't believe in astrology, right? Because that for him is, in a sense, is, um, for so, well, for so many years, people tried to understand the stars and tried to see their fate in the stars. And he says that there was so much meaning, kind of, um, the stars were pregnant with so much meaning that it seemed so strange that almost all of a sudden people were saying, what you believe in you know, the stars are going to tell you your future or who you are or something like that. Like, get out of here, you crazy probably feminist. Like, go s screw off somewhere. To which Baudrillard is suggesting that, you know, all we really have are the stars. All we really have are stories or illusions, metaphors. Metaphors are what make this world what it is. It isn't always, um, not everything can be explained. Like, axiomatically or by uh, theorems or stuff like that. We have to, for Baudrillard, and I think this is what a kind of Baudrillardian politics would look like, maintain some degree of illusion or some degree of mystery in order to keep, you know, new things developing, new ways of looking at the world. So integral reality being opposed to illusion, is uh, it is also opposed to another system, which is part of the illusion. So there are two, uh, either there's integral reality, which he defines as follows as similar to similarly to how I just did it, uh, the irreversible movement towards the totalization of the world. So that is what integral reality is. And that is opposed by what he calls the dual form D U A L. So challenge or agonism, which is the reversibility internal to the irreversible movement of the real. So there's always in that, uh, setup, 
it or the dual form always implies a kind of antagonism that is always already there. Which, you know, I, I think someone listening to this or reading this book who's clever might say, well, Baudrillard, what, what is the problem then? Because you're saying that integral reality is this kind of arriving at a perfect system, which is a bad thing. But then you're also saying that actually the dual form, that is reversibility, is internal to every irreversible system and is imminent to that very logic and is always there. So what is the problem? To, to which I'd say, because I don't know if Baudrillard ever got a question like that. In, yeah, I've read, I think, every one of his interviews, but I, he may have gotten this question somewhere, and I just don't remember. Uh, but I would say that that doesn't mean that the system isn't trying to get rid of this dual form. It, isn't, uh, it is always in the process of trying to exercise this dual form that corresponds to illusion and seduction and reversibility, in order to arrive at a more perfect system. So first and foremost, although this hasn't happened yet, we have to be prepared that it might happen and that currently the system is in the service of trying to make it happen. And some, someone else, or maybe the same hypothetical person, could ask, uh, what is the problem with a world completely total, a totalizing world? Um, because can't we, you know, extract meaning from a world no matter what kind of system it, it is to which Baudrillard would say and he, actually here's a quote so for us however whatever its metaphysical beauty this illusion is unbearable hence the need to produce all the possible forms of a simulacrum of meaning of transcendence things which all mask this original illusoriness and protect us from it so for Baudrillard the kind of original setup that is the one that abides by the logic of illusion, was where, you know, meaning was housed. So in order to kind of curb that loss of meaning that comes out of the simulacrum or integral reality as we see it today, we feel the need to endlessly try to produce meaning in order to convince us that, you know, we haven't lost it. So meaning comes out in, you know, insert example here, like, I don't know, you find meaning in video games, you find meaning in biological determinism you find meaning in x y and z you find meaning in 12 rules for life like as though we can clump these things into neat little boxes and make the world easily digestible but it's very much a response and this is something that nietzsche was writing about or wrote about with the genealogy of morality when he said when he says that asceticism so a-s-c-e-t-i-c-i-s-m asceticism something like that which is the principle of kind of um, inflicting harm on yourself or kind of hating yourself and by virtue of hating yourself, wanting to punish yourself and you live a very bad life because of it. So asceticism, Nietzsche says, is a response to a life uh, that is kind of lost meaning, right? So then we impose rules on ourselves, then we, you know, whip our backs, stuff like that, uh, to try and make up for this loss of meaning. And I think that the same is occurring today, where it doesn't resemble an ascetic life because we enjoy ourselves. But I think for Baudrillard, it'd be like kind of an asceticism of happiness, kind of happy asceticism, where we don't know precisely because we are happy that we are living in a very, a very ascetic life, where we don't have any kind of the problem isn't that we don't necessarily have meaning because it's it'd be difficult to really say what meaning is but the problem is that we don't really reflect on that meaning we we don't wonder like where does this meaning come from is this meaning as it has always been or is this an imposed kind of meaning uh, could my life be better with another kind of meaning and so on and so forth so we give all that up because there's a kind of proliferation of possibility of meaning so we don't need to think about it because if we are unhappy for a moment, then we have X, Y, and Z other options immediately at our disposal. So uh, Lauren Berlant writes about this really well. She applies this to the term uh, cruel optimism or applies cruel optimism to this concept or this phenomenon that people attach themselves to things that they think will make them happy, but that instead do the exact opposite. 
So what Baudrillard says about this is that, but because the seduction of the world and of appearances is dangerous, we prefer to exchange it for its operational simulacrum, its artificial truth and its automatic writing. So our task then, and and in Baudrillard's words, it goes as follows. The task of philosophy is to unmask this illusion of objective reality, a trap that is in a sense laid for us by nature. So, you know, nature is something that lends itself very easily to uh, scientific narratives, right? Where the very taxonomic principles are so, uh, are welcomed by nature, which Baudrillard says, we have to resist that, that um, we have to, oh my God, we have to resist that desire to kind of map out, codify, taxonomize nature, to kind of submit it to this logic of, of reality. So one image that I could think of, I think this comes out of Balt, Roland Roland Balt, uh, who asks the question, I, th- I hope it's Balt, um, how many colors does a child see crawling through the grass so when you think of it you know for us us I assume we're all adults and that we aren't colorblind or blind um, or don't have any some other disability but the kind of uh, assumed able-bodied person who I'm assuming he's hearing this uh, looking at the grass we would see only one color green whereas for a child who hasn't learned about this thing called green and perhaps doesn't even know about colors, what they might see doesn't abide by that logic because as soon as different shades are applied to things, we could hardly say that two different um, two different leaves or grass compared to leaves or, or anything like that are the same color. It's only when we're trained that they become the same color, which I think is what, in a sense, Baudrillard is writing against. And that's a pretty extreme example because that... Um, can be seen in all civilizations to some extent that use language. Language is the way by which we make understanding easier. But I think that it does um, paint the uh, portrait pretty well. That is this desire to codify and kind of homogenize nature. Now, in opposition to uh, this process, that is, in the ca- as one example, the case of nature with the codifying everything. Uh, Baudrillard suggests that he almost opposes this totalizing framework with another one, and that is the idea of singularity that he develops here, which is a complicated idea. So singularity for him is the idea that every anything is perfect in and of itself is a perfect thing. So this is one way to uh, kind of oppose like racist tendencies, for instance, because you can't be racist if you think that every other culture is perfect. Um, in, in, in its own uh, system. And it's only when this idea of singularity goes away then that we usher in possibilities for racism or something like that or, or anything like that, uh, which is bad, obviously. So for him, whereas everything is driving us towards this totalization of the real, we must rather wrest the world from its reality principle. For it is this confusion that conceals from us the world as it is, for that is to say, at bottom, the world as singularity. Sorry, I think that's thunder. So this idea of different, or sorry, this idea of singularity is one to say, is, is an idea of absolute difference, a radical difference, something more different than difference, at the farthest possible remove from the confusion of the world with its double. So then singularity opposes so many tenets that we take to be benevolent today, like the tenet of multiculturalism or something like that, or the melting pot. Um, these ideas that essentially are just facades for a kind of welcoming of difference when really all they do is submit that difference to kind of one overarching logic. Now this is it's exceptionally difficult to if we kind of take on a uh, Marxist put, put on our Marxist caps here to imagine there to be a possibility for singularity in the face of kind of global capitalism where all cultures are expected, if they are to even exist as cultures, to engage in the global market, which could be seen as the undercurrent that actually homogenizes all um, all people. So it'd be difficult to say that we could have this thing called singularity today, or if it's as simple as saying, like, I absolutely see the merit of any given civilization, and I'm not going to fucking tell anyone what to do, um, which I think would be fair. Uh, but in that 
all of these cultures are subjected to the same kind of economic principles, we must ask if that is enough. So that we could say that this, these, this process might have preceded capital. Uh, and Foucault get, gets on about this, where I think that this uh, could also be understood as a biopolitical thing, uh, or under the biopolitical umbrella that reduces all people to uh, the status of you know humans that can be mapped, that can be controlled, understood as populations, which he says precedes capital, might give us um, might give us credence or something to believe that in fact this process does precede capitalism at that and then maybe think that it is by virtue of this process occurring that is all people being generalized under this logic that allowed capitalism to make that global uh, step right so that it could you know force people to uh, become indoctrinated into this global economic system which opposes for Baudrillard the laws of symbolic exchange that he gets at to here or he brings up again where uh, and he, he provides the example of a Japanese story that he says wouldn't be understood in the Western context where a woman um, uh, refuses to jump into uh, the water to save a drowning child because she says that the debt that ch the child would owe me would be greater than its life alone it would be or as great or greater than its life alone and then the child would live uh, in total subservience to that woman right so for us I think you know whoever's listening I speak for myself for me you know it's a difficult thing to hear and of course I don't think anyone should do that but I think it makes a very good point about the way that exchange can be understood outside of the realm of money which shares an indubitable affinity with this global project of Western rationality, that is, it reduces all things to a kind of homogenous state that can be exchanged via this homogenous universal entity that, that is money, capital. Uh, but what this story tells us is that, is that there are other ways by which exchange can occur, and there are other ways by which people can, you know, give and take and owe and, and debt, uh, have debt with one another. And that this um, alternative is a much more radical one for Baudrillard because it completely throws the entire system out of whack because in the act of exchange, at least how it's presented in this story, where the child is expected to return, would, would, would have been expected to return uh, with a gift greater than or equal to its life, to their life, what we see is an endless uh, proliferation where there's always a desire to one-up the other person, lest you are stuck uh, in a kind of um, subordinate state, kind of made subject to the whims of that person, that will of that person. One example that we can see uh, this happening in popular culture today is on The Office. So if you haven't seen the show, this might go over your head. But there's an episode about midway through, maybe it's season five or six or something, when two of the characters, Dwight and Andy, constantly do favors for one another so that they don't fall, they don't have to fall prey to the other's will. So as soon as one of them gives the other something, then that person then returns something in order not to be uh, subject to that person's command. Now what happens is that when you give something back, because it is of a greater gift or it is of a greater value a symbolic value no less that person that received the gift the kind of counter gift is then obliged to return with another counter gift because they've been given something greater not something equal because getting something equal would annul the transaction but by getting something greater that person is then subject to the will of the counter gift counter giver gift giver and is then obliged to return with another one so there's an endless uh, process by which people come to accumulate debt and repay debt and that because these don't abide by or they don't they can't be easily resolved with a thing like money that is a general equivalent what you see are developments in wacky and very strange ways 
and that is presented in the show where they go to odd lengths to satisfy or to return the gift. Now, what I think for Baudrillard is that that presents a moment of exchange that uh, represents possibility. It represents um, kind of drive towards the unknown, the perpetual unknown. Whereas with exchange, you know that anything can be resolved by just throwing money at it. This kind of fake thing uh, that we all accept to be real and, and true and the the very smooth uh, equivalency that it represents that forecloses this possibility, I think. At least I think that's how Baudrillard gets at it here. So I don't know if there's... This is a long book and I was really quick about it because a lot of it is uh, repetitive. But I mean, definitely go and read it. It's pretty accessible, I think, if you have a fair idea about what you know, Baudrillard's project is about or what he's trying to do. Um, but yeah, if anyone listened to this and, you know, they have more, they feel like I didn't, I, I didn't pay enough attention to a certain part. Uh, I was being deliberately quick because, you know, yeah, it's either I'd be really quick or I'd be really thorough and you'd hear a lot of what you probably already know. Uh, but for those that listen, this will probably be the last Baudrillard one I do unless some uh, book gets unearthed or someone reminds me of something that I haven't done yet that isn't just like an essay uh, that actually has some substance to it. Uh, But otherwise, if you have any problems with what I did here, you know how to do it. As I normally say, I'd rather if people leave comments that, you know, that we can keep a discussion going than, you know, subscribing. So if it comes down to one or the other, leave comments. Uh, I prefer that. But if not, do whatever you want, and then I'll see you next time. Take care.